Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shanti, and I'm uh, down here from our Palo Alto community. I'm just thinking, what an amazing uh, blessing, really, in this life to be a part of a community that is filled with people. And I'll say these are all Ananda people that you're hearing. But more important than that, they are all people who are living their lives in such a way to make the greatest effort they can to tune into superconscious inspiration, to intuition. That Ananda does not have a corner on the market on that. So whatever community you're a part of, whatever path you're on, whatever drew you here today, the principles underlying everything that we're speaking about, that we feel our inspiration from here. He's our teacher, he's our teacher, but these are eternal truths. This is what Padma was saying, the essence of what we call Hinduism, that is really Sanatan Dharma, eternal truths. It doesn't matter what path you're on. This is what Patanjali, who is known as the father of yoga, came to tell us. Whatever spiritual path you're on, however you are making an effort, even if you don't call it a spiritual path yet, but you're making an effort to be the biggest and the best that you can be, there are certain steps and stages that we will all need to go through. We're going to do it. We don't even have to be thinking about it. We don't have to worry our little brains about the great principles underlying these spiritual lives. We just are going to have to go through them, and we will. We will be drawn to them in order to grow spiritually, assuming we'll grow spiritually whether we really want to or not. But if we're actually looking to grow spiritually, it'll come easier to us and sooner to us. Padma told this story of how Swami Kriyananda started writing uh, the Gita. What she didn't say is this, I don't think, but a piece of it I know she didn't. Swamiji did not have access to all of the notes to Yogananda's original writings about the Bhagavad Gita. He wanted to write this Gita. It's not right if the Gita is written, but he wanted to write his explanation. But he didn't have uh, his gurus writing on it. And that's what he wanted to put out into the world. And he was sitting and talking to Yogananda one day. Talking means Yogananda left his body in 1952, 68 years ago today, actually. Um, but he was meditating with him, speaking to him in the way he did, the way many of us do. I need your help, I need your guidance. How can I write this book, he said, without all of those notes? And he couldn't get them. And as he was meditating, he heard, don't exclude the possibility of a skylight. Those words came to him as he was wondering how this great book, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, could be written. And what was that skylight? What was Yogananda trying to tell Swami Kriyananda in that moment? He was saying, light can come to you. Information can come to you. In fact, every bit of knowledge there ever was or ever will be can come to you if you open to that possibility. We call it, in our language, in our spiritual language, that oneness, that state of super consciousness. You can call it God, you can call it many things. That when it wanted to create itself and had a thought, I'll, I'll manifest some of this energy that I am. I am all that exists all that ever was or will be. Remember, it's all energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can always be transformed. And the transformation of that energy looks like us. It looks like the chairs we're sitting on. 
looks like our friends, it looks like our enemies, it looks like everything. In order to do that, that oneness became a thought, it became contrasting realities. It manifested as light, but it manifested as darkness. It manifested as truth, it manifested as lies. It manifested as love, it manifested as hate. And this is what's happening. We're living with the manifestation of the soul, which is part of that super consciousness, now identified with the body that we're in, and we call that ego, and the ego is running the show. And our job in this life, the only job that we have, is to go deep enough into the very center that Padma was talking about in the Gita, that Dana was talking about, that Joe Tish started this conference about, every person who's spoken. The whole question is, how do we come back to the essence of who we really are? Because in that essence, in that oneness, in the reality that we are, nothing's changed. We are all still the tiniest ripple of this super conscious existence lies that place of happiness, of joy, of intuitive perception, of what we call super consciousness. There are so many words for it, but you can just call it being happy because that's what it is. And that's how we can relate to the human existence more than anything. How do we get there? When I was um, about 16, I went to my mother and I told my mother that I wanted to be a doctor. And my mother, who was struggling with a lot of things, she and I ended, by the end of her life, she and I were very close. We had a real deeply respectful, mutually loving relationship. However, it took us quite a few years to get there. Uh, in large part, which I didn't know it for at first because she lived her life with so much fear and so much pain. It takes a long time to understand that, particularly when you're the kid. Well, when I told my mother that I wanted to be a doctor, she laughed at me. It was just like this, oh honey, you could never be a doctor. Why don't you just try and be a nurse and let's see how that goes. Well. I was 16, and you know, in those days, maybe not today, as you can see, it was a long time ago. In those days, 16-year-olds paid a little more attention to their parents. I went to nursing school. That's exactly what I did. And I have to say I'm very grateful. I loved being a nurse. But at some point, it started coming back to me. I'm not really doing all of what I could be doing. Now, I loved being a nurse, and if I tell you the truth, though most of you don't know this, the end of the story is I went to medical school, I went to Stanford Medical School, I did just great at Stanford. One by one, as the acceptance letters came in, I mailed them to my mother. <laughs> because one day, in uh, not the, in Encinitas, I knew nothing about Paramahansa Yogananda. But as I was walking under his hermitage, now fast forward, he left his body in 52. This was about 1977. He came to me. I didn't know what a Swami was. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything. But he came to me. I was running. He said to me, you need to go to medical school. And he said, it's got to be an Ivy League school. <laughs> I, I ran home, I said to my husband, you won't believe what I just heard. He said, what do we do? I said, we apply. Why did I say that? Because, remember, the talk is about inner guidance. I had this inner guidance when I was 16, but my mother, my ego, looking out into the world, as Dana was just saying, for answers, 
I listened to those answers, not to what was happening inside of me. It took me till I was 28, some 28 years old, when it came back to me through this great master. You need to go to medical school. I knew it to be true. The instant I heard it, there is no doubt. The title of this talk is How to Know and Trust Your Inner Guidance. The knowing and the trusting. There's a lot more that I'll say about it. But when something comes to you like that, that strong, that kind of clear, you need to go to medical school. And it needs to be an Ivy League school. Can you imagine? He was leaving no doubt in my mind. And so I applied. Harvard, Yale, Duke, Stanford. My husband said, don't you want a safe school? I said, I don't need a safe school. You know, here's, here's the most interesting part of the story. I had never gone to college. You know, you have to, this is, I, I can't get sidetracked by that, but for now, it's interesting. But, I mean, it's beautiful. It's the love of God. It had nothing to do with me. This is what I want everybody to hear. I didn't, I didn't know him. I didn't know anything. But my heart was open. And when God himself spoke to me, I heard it and I knew it. What I have come to know since then, through hundreds of experiences in medicine, in life, on this extraordinary spiritual path, because as you might imagine, when I was accepted to these medical schools without a college degree, I pretty much felt I'd better find this guy and follow him. <laughs> I didn't know who he was or what he was, but it's like, he knows a lot that I don't know. Anyway, all part of another story. It's just like when Padma was speaking and she was telling the story of the Bhagavad of the Gita, well, before the Gita, when Arjuna was sitting there, and he gets the first choice. Krishna's lying there. Many of you were here, some of you weren't. And he looks at Arjuna and Duryodhana, the two heads of the two armies who are going to fight. And he says, I'll give myself to one of you, and I'll give my army to the other one. But if you choose me, I'm not going to fight. I will just ride in your chariot with you. Now this is God himself. He had a huge army. Arjuna wins the dice roll. He gets to choose first. Arjuna's the good guy, just stay with me. And Arjuna looks at Krishna, a manifestation of divine energy, and he says, I'll take you. I mean, Duryodhana thought he had died and gone to heaven. You know, he goes, I have a thousand soldiers on my side now. And as Padma said before, Krishna kept saying, I'm not going to fight, but you will have me. What does that mean? That means you will have truth on your side. You will have wisdom on your side. You will find joy. You will find everything you think you're looking for in life, you will win the battle. You have to win when you tune into your intuitive perception, which comes, as Dana said, from that part of you that is this, I mean, all of you that's the soul, but this became so attached to this little body that we give our egos a lot of power we give a lot of our soul's knowing, everything. You have to just hear this, and because it's only a 30 minute talk, just believe it for now. Try and do what a couple of my patients used to try and do, when I would give them assignments that they didn't like. Be nice to your husband, exercise three hours a week, start doing art again, which you put away when you became a mother and forgot that you needed to take care of that intuitive side of you, they would get very mad at me. I used to write it on prescriptions. Everybody <laughs> loves a prescription, right? And they would come back to me sometimes. Shanti, 
I did this to try to prove you wrong. But what happened? Their lives changed. Why did their lives change? Because they were doing something that was opening these channels in them, that was allowing energy to flow, that was connecting them from their lowest chakras. I mean, who was it who was talking today about, they didn't call it the Sushumna, but this astral spine. It's where everything important and meaningful is happening. It is not happening out there. My mother loved me, but she did not know the truth. The people at Stanford were really good people practicing great medicine, but they blew it. They let me in without a degree, but I didn't disappoint them. This is the point. You can't go to medical school without a college degree. Nobody in this world does that. We know that. If you happen to have a master on your side, you can. And furthermore, you can actually become a pretty darn good doctor. You don't really need all of these. I'm not saying it's a bad idea to, idea to get a bachelor's degree. Believe me, I'm not. I'm all for education. And I'm all for going about it in the right way. Because if you're not tuned in, them, you better be careful if you're out there trying to just wing it in a lot of ways. But the whole point is, all of these systems have been created, all of these boxes that we're supposed to fit into, all of these ways of thinking. Even St. Francis himself, you know, this is interesting. St. Francis was having these visions, and he really got, I'm sure many of you know the story of St. Francis, he had a great life. He was a rich Italian boy, he loved to party. This is all true. I mean, he threw the best parties in the world. He loved to sing. He loved to crack jokes. And then he started having visions. He started having awarenesses of the divine. One day, he was in a little church that was falling apart. And God said to him, Francis, he literally came to him and said, rebuild my church. Probably many of you have heard that story. Francis didn't know what. He knew he heard it. He knew it was the truth. Like going home and saying to your husband, I have to apply to medical school. Francis went and he started building the church. He went, literally went out and carried the supplies himself. But that's not really what God meant. What, what that divine force, intuition, knowing, was telling him is that you have to help people find true inspiration again. Plug into the divine again. Everybody's getting sidetracked by this material world that you're living in. Very materialistic at that time. In fact, celebrating the material world because trade was just happening around on the oceans. I mean, they could get things that they could never get before. God comes to Francis and says, uh-uh. Francis didn't really understand what was happening. How to know and trust inner guidance. He believed what he heard. And if we can do that, even if it's not exactly right how to know it and trust it, you start out. You go out and you get some stones and you carry them to the church. You get cement, you get wood. And as you start moving towards that intu intuitive knowing, the voices that we hear, that often speak to us so quietly. You know, God doesn't come in screaming at you, waving a banner. That's not what happens. I'm here and I demand. No, not at all. A little intuition. That's how things happen. A little whisper. Because the divine is saying, I'm here and I'm going to show you the way to everywhere you think you want to go. But you have to pay attention. You have to bring commitment to it. You have to bring willpower to it. You have to bring all of your desire to get better. Your willingness to begin to turn away from everything that you've been taught. And if you do that, I'll whisper to you. I'll show you. But listen, this is why Christ said very clearly, for those who have ears to hear, I came here. I am not this man. 
I am Christ consciousness. I am everything that exists. I am you. Christ said to us, everything I am, you are too. That's what he said to the Jewish people. Please hear me. I'm not telling you I'm something you are not. We are all made of the same stuff. But when they wouldn't listen, he just, he picked up the cross and he carried it. He carried that cross. I mean, it's amazing. Not even whoever you are, whatever religion you follow, it doesn't matter. Not necessarily in the way we've been taught in the Judeo-Christian teachings. The cross he was carrying is the cross we all need to carry. It's the heaviness, the work of turning inward instead of living outward, which is so easy. My God, there's a lot of billboards in this town. It's remarkable. You, I mean, everywhere you look, you're just drawn into, this will make you happy, that'll make you happy, this will get you the partner you want, this will make you sexier, richer, smarter, everything. I mean, it's crazy making. And Jesus and Buddha and Krishna and Yogananda have all come to us out of pure love and said, listen, listen carefully. I'll share another story with you that happened to me about listening. And then I, I want to just leave you with a few tips. <clears throat> One day I was in my office and it was very, very busy. Both of my partners were away. So I was covering my practice and their two practices. I, I don't remember how many people I saw that day, patients. I'm in my doctor head now, not my up here talking to you about the Gita and spiritual truths at, but And 40 some people I saw. And this, my friend desk lady comes to me and says to me, there's a man, he's a friend of one of your patients, she told me his name. He wants you to see him now, today. He has a cold, a cold. I said, I can't see him today. I have no room, I already don't have enough room to see the people I see. I said, tell him to go to an urgent care clinic. 10 minutes later, she comes back, she goes, he's not taking no for an answer. He really wants to come in. I said, I can't. Explain to him, add up, tell him how many patients. The third time she comes back to me, I said to her, okay, tell him this. He can come in. It's going to be a five-minute visit. It's not going to be a good visit. I'm irritated with him. He's probably not going to like me. Tell him all this. This is true. So she, she schedules him. The guy comes in. And he, he does. He has an upper respiratory illness. And something in me, just a whisper, this is why I'm telling you this story, a whisper, says to me, listen to his heart. But Shanti, not, not trying to be centered. Shanti, the ego, says, I'm not listening to this guy's heart. Listen to his heart. No, I said. I'm not. I don't have time. He has a cold. And I feel that. And I knew it to be true. I felt it like, OK, listen to this. I put my stethoscope on his chest, and he has a horrible heart murmur. A dangerous heart murmur. I heard it. I have to shorten this story, but by the next day, he was at Johns Hopkins. I was working in Baltimore. And he was on the operating room table having cardiac surgery. He had what had been a congenital aneurysm right where his aorta uh, meets his left ventricle. I don't know how much that means to any of you. But that is every ounce of blood that goes through your body. If that aneurysm, with, which is a bulging burst, you have seconds, you're gone. That's it, no way to save you. When that was all over, he comes in to see me. And he said to me, because I had said to him, has anybody ever told you you have a murmur? He said, I don't have a murmur. I said, yes, you do have a murmur. He said, no. I know. I said, listen, I already didn't have time. Now we have to argue. I don't know you. You don't know me. Listen to me. You have a heart rumor. This is serious. Please. 
Anyway, he comes back and he said to me, I just knew I had to see you that day. He knew he had to see me, and I knew I had to listen to his heart. I could stand up here now, as I bet all of you could, and tell you story after story after story. There are things, there are extraordinary things happening in ordinary lives. What we need to do is find the ways to learn to listen. When that little voice comes and says, don't get on the freeway, you'll just don't. And you go, of course I'm gonna get on the freeway, I need to get home. And then you wind up stuck for two hours because there was an accident. When something says to you, turn your cell phone on, and 30 minutes later you get a call from your child's school that your child's sick. These, they happen to us all the time. We have to learn to listen. When we have that first time where we're listening, and we hear it and it turns out to be true, we need to go back and say to ourselves, what did that feel like? What was it like when everything in me was fighting? No, no, no. And then I put the stethoscope there. Or I go home and I fill out the applications. Or whatever it is, all of the times that you look back and you could say to yourself, I actually knew that, and I knew it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And if you start doubting yourself, you step into it slowly. Maybe you don't do the whole thing. Maybe you fill out the first page of an application, whatever it is in your life, that you're supposed to leave your job now and look for a new job. Or relationship issues or something comes to you about one of your children that feels important, but you don't want to hear it, just move forward with it a little bit and then stop and tune in again. That's what we have to do. We have to tune into the person who's driving our chariot. We have to listen carefully. What is he trying to say to me? What is this voice trying to say, what is this thing that's tugging at me? Are you telling me the truth we say to our children? Of course I'm telling you the truth, Mom. Why am I feeling like you're not telling me the truth? Why don't we sit and talk? Or why don't I go out for an evening with my child or sit up in their room and give them room to tell me because I heard it and it's probably important. So I step into it. And here's the thing, intuition, inner guidance, those are soul properties. They're not ego properties. The ego gets in the way. It doesn't want us to hear. It creates ripples in this incredibly calm, smooth pond. So you can't see through the water in the pond. But the soul does it. It's clarity. It's solution-oriented. It is always right. Always. We just have to find it. So when those thoughts come, and we're sure, just, I know something. I just know it. It's time for me to leave this job. Something else is trying to happen. Then say to yourself, let me sit with this. Is it really true? Does it bring me a sense of joy when I think of it? Does it bring me a sense of calmness? Do I feel a kind of clarity with it? Because these are qualities of the soul, and you will find them with any true intuition, with any true guidance, you will find those qualities and you will not find them when the ego is involved. You will not find them because the ego that represents likes and dislikes our desires, and desires pull us. I really want that new car. I've always known that I needed to have a Mercedes and I'm getting it. 
Well, if a little voice comes to you and says, there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't go out and buy that Mercedes now. What do we do when our desires are strong? Or our likes and our dislikes? We ignore that. We can't even hear it. It's like we're going, no, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you. Of course we can. We have our fingers in our ears. Taking our fingers out of our ears means getting still and quiet. It means ultimately where so many speakers have gone today. It means honestly learning to meditate. Because in meditation, the whole point this is what Kriya Yoga is. You've been hearing about it all day. But nobody has said to you, <clears throat> it's a meditation technique. That's what Kriya Yoga is. And, but it's a powerful technique that helps us come right here, right into the center, into the core of our being, where all of those soul qualities reside and basically using techniques to still the waters, to calm the energy, to get rid of the chaos that's in our astral spine, to really neutralize and calm it. That's what meditation does. And it gives us ears to hear. They're not these ears. They're our spiritual ears. They're the knowing that lives up here at the point between the eyebrows. And we meditate to get energy flowing as smoothly as we can, drawing energy in, because that flow creates magnetism. That magnetism draws us into our center, and it brings all of the chaos into a calm, centered place right up here, and then we say, oh, this is what's being asked of me. This is how I should find my way back to joy. This is how I will solve the problems of the future in ways that nobody knows about yet, because they're not out there, just like Dana was saying. Brilliantly, she was saying it. We are looking for solutions that are yet to be revealed, and the revelation is inside. This is why Swamiji is so it's not even brilliantly, it's intuitively, perceptively, masterfully called his book, Revelations of Christ. That's where it all is. That's what we need to do. We need to find ways to calm the still waters, to raise our energy through our heart and let it expand up into our natural state of superconsciousness.